So hello everyone in the US, Israel, Palestine, and other places in the world. Welcome to this latest installment of Conversations with Israel and Palestine, hosted by Partners for Progressive Israel. Conversations with Israel and Palestine is a series of informational webinars that brings voices from Israel and Palestine to an American audience, providing an important link between progressives in the US and in the world. Uh, my name is Dr. Anwar Mahajni, and for and I'll be the moderator for the next 60 minutes. Um, I'm originally from Umm al-Fahim, it's a town in the northern part of Israel. I'm currently living in the US. Um, I work as a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Stonehill College in Massachusetts uh, in the US. Uh, so before we get started, uh, let me note that Partners for Progressive Israel is an American nonprofit organization dedicated to the achievement of durable and just peace between Israel and its neighbors. And they also believe in the need to ensure civil rights, equality, and social justice for all Israel's inhabitants. Partners seek to deepen the American public's understanding of Israel's complexity in order to enhance its ability to advocate for a progressive Israel, uh, Israeli future. So um, I will now introduce our speakers. The bios, I shortened them a bit, uh, but Thayer and Fadi, if you want to add anything, please feel free to do so later on in the conversation. Um, so Thayer Abu Ras is a PhD student in the Department of Government and Politics and a fellow at the Gildenhorn Institute for Israeli Studies at the University of Maryland, College Park. Uh, Thayer's research is focused on politics of identity, particul particularly uh, the evolution of Jewish political identity in Israel. Um, Thayer is also a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Uh, Fadi, Shibat, Fadi Shibata, I, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, he holds an MA in conflict resolution he is currently co-directing the Equality Policy Department of Sikui, Association for the Advancement of Civic Equality. Um, as I said, I shortened their bio. They both have engagement in civil society and NGOs, but they can tell you more about it when we start the conversation. Uh, let me just add that the discussion will go on for about 40 minutes, after which we'll be answering questions from the video audience. Um, I encourage you to type in your question at any time all you need to do is look at the bottom of your screen. So if you move the mouse on the screen or touch the screen, you'll see a bar that appears at the bottom and there's an icon that reads Q&A. So click on the icon and type your question in the small box that appears. So the webinar won't disappear or be disrupted. Please note that the viewer microphones turn, uh, are turned off and questions can only be asked this way. So you only have, you, we can only answer your question if you type them, otherwise we won't be able to hear. Okay. So to start the conversation, um, I have a question for both of our uh, panelists. Again, thank you, Fadi, and thank you, Thad, for agreeing to participate in this and share your experience and expertise with us. Uh, my first question relates to ident uh, identity. So how do you identify in relations to the state, the state of Israel? Why do you identify this way? And how do you think the way you identify fits in within the general population in Israel, within the Arab community in Israel? So I think we can start with Thayer and then move to Fadi, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm in the DC area, so it's still afternoon here. Um, <clears throat> looking forward to this discussion. Um, I personally identify as a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Um, now, identity obviously is a big issue in Israel. It's not only a big issue among Jewish Israelis, but also Palestinian citizens of Israel. You'd get many different kinds of definitions, um, but I think it's in the realm of the mainstream definition um, of what we call the Arab community in Israel. Um, why do I identify that way? I guess mainly because that's how I feel. I mean, on the one hand, I feel um, an ethnic and cultural tie to um, the Palestinian people in general. Uh, but at the same time, I also feel, um, I guess what we can call a civil uh, tie to um, the state of Israel, um, contemporary Israeli culture, whatever that means. And we can delve into that, I guess, a little bit more. Um, but I mean, that's, that's who I am. Um, and it's also, I guess, one of our problems, right? That on the one hand, our ethnic community is, has been in a war, I guess what you could call an existential conflict with the country that we are citizens of and we contribute to in many different ways. So yeah, um, I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel, I guess. So now, thank you. Well, 
if I'll start from the end, so it's the same definition, and I will explain why. For me, identity is, uh, we can answer this question administratively. Obviously, we have the Israeli IDs. We are Israeli citizens. You know, we are different from our Palestinian brothers in the West Bank and Gaza or Palestinian refugees by our uh, civil status. But for me, this is administrative. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll answer the question of my identity the way I see it based on my family background. Uh, my family comes originally from a village. It was destroyed in 1948 and we were expelled three kilometers away. And I was born in the, in the neighboring village three kilometers away. Uh, and our lands were confiscated. Now, part of my family stay, remained within what became, became Israel in terms of borders. Part of it is in Kalkilia and the West Bank. Another part is in Tul Karim and other part is in Jordan as refugees. So, and, and there was a period after 1948 that there was a danger of uh, moving us to what's uh, Tul Karim refugee camp uh, today. So if we were moved there, there would be no question of defining uh, us as Palestinians, West Banker Palestinians, and now uh, in the Israeli general discourse, uh, people kind of, like most of the Jewish population wouldn't like it when we define ourselves as Palestinians. Uh, and I think just, just like explaining the family background can uh, clarify uh, that, you know, the Palestinian people were divided into the different groups uh, after 1948, which is the base, uh, um, let's say, starting point to understand the reality today also. Um, so yeah, back to your question. I define myself as a Palestinian citizen of Israel. So I'm just going to follow up really quick on my question. Um, have you ever, you said that sometimes the Jewish community doesn't like it when you identify as a Palestinian. So do you encounter resistance, resistance from people within Israel, Arabs, Jewish, and as well as people outside when they hear the label Palestinian uh, and then Israeli citizen. Because for me, I, I noticed that if I'm around Arab, like Arabs from Arab country and I mention Israel, everyone gets upset with me. And if I'm around the Jewish community and say Palestine, everyone gets upset with me. So I don't know if you guys have similar experiences with that. Yeah, sure. I mean, um... In Arab countries, I find, I, I think it, it changed a little bit in the last years. There is more and more awareness about the Palestinian minority within Israel. Uh, but it, you, the situation used to be that uh, people in the Arab countries will see it as Israel, Palestine, Palestinians in Palestine, Jews in Israel, and then they wouldn't understand what is this creature <laughs> of Palestinians in Israel. Uh, but I think there is more and more awareness of it, especially after the, um, uh, the media, uh, the Arab media channels developed and uh, there is a good coverage of uh, the reality of the Palestinians within, within Israel. Um, I don't find it difficult defining myself or explaining the situation when I'm abroad. Uh, yeah, I, I do find it kind of complicated because it's not just kind, where are you from? I'm French or I'm German. I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Oh, what is that? <laughs> so yeah, in this sense, uh, it needs more explanation. It's, it's not just like I'm from there. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, there's much more. I also feel that there's much more understanding today. People are much more aware um, of this community. Um, I mean, I remember going back maybe 15 or 16 years ago, um, I was in a high school in the United States, which was an international high school. And many Arab students who were with me simply did not understand what that meant. Many people actually thought I was what we would call a Mizrahi Jew. When I tell them I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel, many of them thought, oh, you're the Arab Jew or whatever that is supposed to mean. But I think it mainly has to do with the, uh, I guess what you can call the media revolution in the Arab world. Um, all of a sudden people from all around the Arab world are able to hear different voices and all of a sudden you'd have people coming out and speaking in Arabic from Haifa, Jaffa or Jerusalem and people now understand more um, than they did in the past. And um, yes, obviously it is a massive complexity, but I guess it's, um, it's an identity complex that we have come to learn and to live with. Hopefully one day we will be able to somehow um, get over it, but uh, at this point we haven't, and it's definitely ingrinded within us, if I can say so. 
Yeah, I feel like when I tell my students where I come from, they think I'm a unicorn that came out of the <laughs> They don't understand that Palestinians live inside of Israel. And I think it's fascinating, though. But there is, uh, of course, as you said, um, you see that people are more aware of us than before, and that's good. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, the next question is going to take us um, to the challenges facing Palestinian citizens of Israel today. So what are the challenges that are facing the community today? Um, and how do you think these challenges shape the relationship of the community with the state of Israel? And whoever wants to start can go first. All right, Fadi. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think like the complexities, well, I'll connect it to the, to the previous question, actually, because I think the, the complexity in our identity is not, for me, my identity is clear. The complexity is the perception of Israelis of what should be an identity of somebody living in Israel. And it's also the way it's perceived outside. Because um, finally, we, we, we talk about the conflict as a complex issue uh, and so on. The, the, the story is, is quite simple <laughs> in its basis. There was a group that came from outside uh, because of different historical reasons, because of the Holocaust, because of uh, racism in Europe and so on. Uh, but the fact is that there, there was a group, ethnic group that came from outside and took the space of the local population, whatever you call them, if you call them Palestinians or Arabs or whatever. And connecting it to your, to your question, um, we, we are acting in, in two parallel spheres. One is um, our rights as citizens in the, uh, in the civil sphere within, within Israel, within the current reality, in the here and now. And the other is part of the Palestinian people that were divided uh, to different groups. And we are one of them that remained within the borders of Israel with different set of rights that are better than uh, Palestinians in the West Bank, for example. We are citizens, we go to civil court, they go to military court. We have more freedom of movement, while well, they don't. There is discrimination within Israel, but it's not comparable with the Palestinians in the West Bank or Gaza and so on. So there is the national, national issue are still living uh, in a reality of, uh, of uh, conflict. And there is also the civil, the civil issue and the daily life, uh, education, infrastructure, uh, improving, uh, advancing a life, improving our daily life. Um, so I, I will kind of dive into the uh, question per se. Uh, what are the challenges facing uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel today? Um, I would argue actually that the uh, Palestinian community in Israel is at a very interesting crossroad in our history. Um, on the one hand, I feel that there is greater economic and focus here more on economic and to a lesser extent cultural integration um, within Israel, especially among the youth. And, and the youth here are, are more important because about 60% of the population is under the age of 30. This is a young population at the end of the day. But at the same time, we're witnessing greater exclusion uh, from the public sphere and more acceptance of racism within, uh, within Israeli society. This isn't obviously to say that racism did not exist before. It did, but it wasn't highlighted as it is, in my opinion, today. So we're really working within this different, um, within this oxymoron, if you want. On the one hand, greater uh, integration, greater um, um, personal and even community success stories on the one hand. But at the same time, we're talking uh, about greater, uh, more um, a political atmosphere that is more um, unwelcoming uh, towards um, the uh, community. Um, and, and that is basically, at least at the macro level, the main challenge that we face today within Israeli society and trying to overcome this oxymoron, in my opinion, is probably the main issue that we're going to have to deal with and try and find ways where we will be able to overcome overcome this issue. And we can dive into specific policies in a little bit if you want. Yeah, so that would be my next question. You can actually talk about specific policies that influence political engagement and the status of the community in Israel. So from your experience, from things that are happening on the ground, what are these policies and how are they influencing the community? So, I mean, I would also divide these into two issues. One of them would be issues within the Arab community, so internal uh, challenges facing the Arab community. And then there are the more external ones that are uh, 
vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with the state. Not to say that the internal issues aren't influenced by the state, they're heavily influenced by the state, um, but there are also issues that are unique to the Arab uh, community. Um, one of them would be internal violence, as I would call it. Um, over the last generation, really, we have witnessed a very dangerous phenomenon that we did not witness before, and that is the rise of violence within the Arab community. I believe in um, 2017, over 70 people were, were, were killed in internal violence in the Arab community. That has to do mainly with the lack of law and order uh, within Arab towns and villages and cities. And, and we use these terms, villages and towns, even though a lot of these, what we call villages and towns, have become cities nowadays. And that's, and that's part of the problem, what I call failed urbanization. And the other one has to do with what I would call land planning or the lack of land planning in the Arab community. Um, basically, when we talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we usually focus on the ethnic dimensions or the national dimensions of the conflict. And we kind of forget all the other characteristics. One of the probably more important characteristics is the issue of land and who owns the land uh, in the country. Um, the Arab population is uh, about 21% of the overall population of Israel, but yet we only own about 3% of the land. Obviously from 1948 up until the 1970s, up until the late 1970s, there was massive land confiscation. Over 70% of private land was confiscated. And today we own about only 3% of the land. So what you had was the population boom on the one hand, um, but land did not increase. Um, and that led to a lot of problems. The main one would be uh, what I would call urbanization failure, which led to um, certain um, social epidemics, such as violence uh, that we are witnessing today, something that up until the 1990s, for example, was unheard of in the Arab community. And then you have the exogenous uh, variable, which, uh, which would be um, government policies and government planning. Um, and here we, as I said, we've seen on the one hand, greater economic integration. You have a right-wing government which has actually increased budgets, which has allocated certain budgets for more economic um, for more economic development, but it's only economic development. We have not seen any kind of trying to, um, um, the development of the Arab community at the political level or for greater integration within um, the political echelons of society to say, um, um, so, th so these are really the main challenges, the internal challenges within the Arab community, which again are heavily affected by state policies, but also need the Arab community itself to kind of uh, um, take the lead on this issue. And then you have the issue of, of discrimination. Obviously discrimination has always existed, but in the last generation, and with the rise of right-wing politics in Israel, or this new right in Israel, if you want to call it that way, um, we have seen even greater discrimination on all levels of, of society. So that's the challenges that I see. Okay, so Fadi, before we go to you, I want to remind the audience, um, that please feel free to type in your question at any point. I see them all in front of me. And whenever we get to the q and I'm going to read them um, and we can answer them live. Our participants are going to answer them live. Okay, Fadi. I completely agree that these are the two uh, main issues um, or challenges facing the Palestinian community within Israel. One is, uh, is urban development uh, and land, and the other one is the internal violence or the, the development of, uh, of organized crime, basically, that is not um, uh, dealt with by the Israeli police. Um, and here, I, I think it's less of an internal issue. It's more an issue of, of the lack of governance of, uh, of the government who have the, the tools we have the police, the tools to, to face organized crime and, and not doing it in, uh, in the Arab uh, towns and cities. Um, we need to say that we are not part of shaping the policies in Israel. We are subject to the policies in Israel. We do have parliament members. Uh, we did have now 13 uh, parliament members in the Knesset out of 120. Uh, but they were never in the government historically, and uh, they, they can't be really in the government because we're talking about the context of Palestinians represented in the parliament of the, the, the Zionist Jewish state, as it defined itself, uh, with the nation law uh, just reflecting that recently in, in Britain. Um, so basically, the basic definition of the regime in Israel 
is the problem, in my opinion. Like we are in a complexity of, well, in this, if this regime and the structure and mechanisms of this regime that reflects uh, the state defining itself as a Jewish state is, remains there, we cannot achieve civil equality. I think there is no way to disconnect uh, achieving civil equality between Palestinians and Jews within Israel uh, than talking about the meaning of the state defining itself as a Jewish Zionist state, which is based on the paradigm of this place belongs to us as an ethnic, as an ethnic group. And you wouldn't hear any governmental official saying the Palestinians. They would always refer to us as the minorities or as a bunch of ethnic groups that it's not clear how we get there <laughs> while we are the indigenous population. Um, and uh, if we, when, we, when I talk about mechanisms going to the urban uh, development issue, the state controls 93% of the lands in Israel. Well, a lot of them were confiscated from the Palestinian population in the first hand. Uh, so in one hand, uh, vast uh, confiscations and, or nationalizing, if you want. And on the other hand, allocation for Jews only, uh, if I don't put it in a political correct term. Uh, the state built hundreds of uh, towns that became cities uh, like Upper Nazareth, just next to Nazareth, uh, and Carmel, and like so, around 700, more than 700 uh, new uh, towns and, uh, and communities, uh, while zero for the Palestinians. Uh, so the state also deals with the lands as kind of nation lands, means Jewish lands. Uh, while 20% of the population is Palestinian. And this is, again, based on the basic conception of the state on itself, that it's a state of Jews uh, as an ethno ethno ethnocratic state, and not really a democratic state. And as long as this doesn't change, it's going to reflect again and again in the state policy. Okay, thank you both. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next, the next question, which is kind of related to this. Um, so I was wondering, so we noticed that in the recent elections, there was a lower voter turnout in the Arab community compared to 2015. Um, so what do you think was, the, what resulted in that? What caused that lower turnout um, compared to a previous year or to the previous elections? We should go. Uh... Give Fed in. I think, uh, in the um, last elections that we're going to have a game now, <laughs> there, was too much difference. Uh, there was an atmosphere, um, people lost hope in, uh, in the system in, the in, in one hand, and also people were very disappointed, I'm to talking about the Palestinian community within Israel. Um, so there were two main reasons for this disappointment. One is the right-wing government and uh, you know high officials, including the prime minister, saying very racist things about their own citizens and so, so on. Uh, and the inability of representatives in the parliament to influence any policies. Uh, this is in one, ta one hand. And in the other hand, there was a unique experience this time with the joint list where all the Palestinian political parties managed to, to unite in one list. Uh, and this gave a big hope and this raised also the percentage of uh, vote uh, in the previous elections. Uh, and this time they didn't manage to, to agree on, uh, on one list. Uh, and this was also a big part of the disappointment of the voters and we saw that reflecting in the percentage of, uh, of the voters. Uh, we went down from 65, around 65% to 55%. Uh, so there is a danger that we go even under the 50%. You have to unmute your mic. Sorry about that. Um, I mean, put it simply, uh, I think the Palestinian citizens in Israel, and particularly here, the youth, there's also a generational gap here, in my opinion. Um, put it simply, they don't believe the system works for them. Um, on the one hand, uh, and by that I mean that um, nobody uh, amongst the Jewish uh, uh, political elite in Israel 
really cares about the Arab community. You can see it not only in um, in the policies of um, of the political parties, be it the, se the center or left or whatever you want to call it. But by the way, even in the media, I mean, I was following the media very closely uh, for the April elections. And when they talk about the Arab community, it is, I mean, these vague statements that don't mean, uh, that don't mean much. You can tell that all these political reporters don't really understand what they're talking about. And the problem is they don't even have an interest in understanding what's going on. So the Arabs are what we would call um, in Hebrew, to take words from uh, the Nakba. Um, they are there, but at the same time, they are, not, um, um, they are not there. So that's one part of the issue. Arabs simply feel that the political system in Israel does not really care about them, their voices are in, and their concerns. And at the same time, there's this huge, huge disappointment with the Arab parties and the Arab political elite in Israel. First of all, they're seen as ineffective. Um, the fact that they cannot, uh, they cannot produce what we would call in political science, at least pork, right? Um, gains for uh, their own community. Um, and at the same time, uh, as Fadi said, um, the uh, dissolution of the joint list angered a lot of people. Many people thought that the joint list was uh, a new beginning, um, that finally the Arab community was able to unite under one political umbrella. Um, and um, there has always been this demand of a political unity. People simply do not understand why all these political parties are unable to unite, at least at the Knesset level. Because um, if you go back and look at the data, these, <clears throat> these parties vote 97% of the time, basically the same, the same votes. So why is it that you are unable to unite into one list? And when people saw the petty politics and um, each party, uh, you know, fighting over one extra seat or one less seat, that angered a lot of people. And all these calls for boycotts, uh, for boycotting the election um, started to rise. And if you look at the data, actually, Arab citizens voted almost in similar numbers as Jewish citizens up until 1999. What happened after 1999? Well, the Second Intifada, which was a huge disappointment. And after the Second Intifada, we just started to see the trend go down um, and, and, and still basically going down. So basically this whole idea that I'm, uh, I'm unable to affect the political system, um, the, Jewish, uh, um, um, the Jewish political elite in, in the center and center left who are quote unquote supposed to be our allies, at least at the, political, at the theoretical level, um, who are supposed to be our allies, don't really care about us. Um, and then our own political leadership is ineffective and it, and it uses a lot of its time in petty political uh, fights that do not really uh, help our community. I think these were the main reasons. And it was interesting because when you followed social media on election day, um, many people in the center left and supporters of the center left in Israel were very angry with the Arab community that why are you not voting? And you, because of you, Netanyahu is going to win another term. I think that shows the symptom or the real problem here is that the center left in Israel don't even understand the Palestinian community in Israel. They never had a genuine interest of understanding the Palestinian community. And why is it for them that somebody like Gantz is not really different than Netanyahu? Well, put it simply, Gantz didn't even campaign in the Arab community. I mean, um, people like Gantz would usually go to, I guess, the usual suspects from a Zionist perspective, who are the Druze or the uh, Bedouin villages in the north being those villages that, you know, go to the army. But these represent maybe 15% of the Arab community. They did not even try to talk to 85% of the Arab community. And then they were surprised why people did not come out and vote or have the same same logic that many people in the center left had that, well, you know, Gantz is better than Netanyahu, so therefore I'm not going to vote for Labor, I'm not going to vote for Meretz, I'm going to vote uh, for Gantz. And then they were surprised that the Arab uh, community, uh, the Palestinian community in Israel, did not have that same kind of uh, way of thinking. And it's not by chance they did not have that same kind of thinking because these groups did not even outreach to the Arab community. So it's a mixture of all these things, lack of belief in the system, the fact that the center left did not outreach to the Arab community and a huge, huge disappointment with our own political leadership. Thank you guys. Um, so uh, I just wanna remind the audience again, please feel free to type in your questions. I see them as they come and then towards the end, we'll try to answer as many as possible. Uh, so I'm gonna move on to the next question. Uh, and I think we need to bring in the, uh, the nation state law and uh, what role that played uh, in also voter turnout um, in the Israeli election. But before I, uh, let me just provide a bigger like question. 
um, during the election, we heard calls for boycott, and then we, ha we heard calls for like voting in droves in the community. So we had two camps. Um, so I was wondering if you guys could rationalize both arguments. Why should you vote? Why shouldn't you vote? Which one do you think is more effective? And do you think this low, lower voter turnout and these scams are going to affect the next uh, elections that is coming up in September? Hmm. Well, uh, actually, I wrote an article about it, not in English. <laughs> and the title was, the, like, within this discussion of boycotting or going to vote, and the title was, the Knesset is not our national parliament as Palestinians, and the boycott is not a work plan. Um, and, and I think that um, the, the change for us is not going to come from the Knesset. Um, using the tool, the parliamentary tool, is important. Uh, we are part of the system whether we like it or not. Uh, we are advocating to change it from a system that represents one ethnic group uh, with colonial uh, mechanisms within it. Uh, when we talk about the nation law, I will refer to what I mean by colonial mechanisms that still exist, to a more just system that um, represents both communities and that share resources. Uh, but it's important to say that we are really far from that. Israel is still living under complete ignorance of the consequences for the Palestinian people when the state was established. And we can see that reflecting in all levels of policies, uh, including educational uh, policies. Most of Arabs and Jews live separately. Uh, most of uh, Jewish students go to Jewish schools and they don't hear at all the Palestinian narrative. That's why they don't understand as adults the uh, Palestinian community. Yeah, and then it reflects in politics too. So it's, it's all over the state mechanisms, this ignorance of, of the Nakba, what happened to the Palestinian people um, as, as a main source of our reality today. Um, to, the state, the, to the nation state law, um, well, I think it didn't bring, bring anything new. All was there in terms of uh, the current system. The state law said Israel is the Jewish state only for Jews. Uh, uh, the immigration laws in Israel since its establishment more or less are for Jews only. Um, the allocation of land is done on ethnic basis too. Uh, the mechanism of allocation of land uh, is giving Kakal uh, six out of 14 representatives uh, with no Arab represent representatives at all. And this is the body that decides on, on the policy of land allocation. Kakal declares very clearly on their website that uh, the land need to be used for Jewish uh, settlement in, uh, in Israel. Um, so uh, the whole, uh, all the, all these deep mechanisms, let's say, of, of the regime in Israel, uh, these, these are the real meaning of the state defining itself as a Jewish state. It's not a symbolic issue. It's a very practical issue on the ground. Okay. Um, so you asked um, to rationalize the arguments, to kind of introduce the audience to the two arguments uh, for boycotting and for voting. So I'll try and represent faithfully both sides of this debate because it is at the end of the day an interesting debate. So, I mean, those who support voting, uh, I think it's a little bit clear, especially for this audience. Um, it's not like that we have the privilege or the luxury to uh, boycott. Um, it's not that we have other alternatives. Um, it is important to be part of the system, to influence the system. There's actually another argument, which is a very interesting argument, and it makes a lot of sense to me, and it's that the Palestinian community in Israel is actually at the peak of its potential, and I, and I emphasize the word here, potential influence on the Israeli political system. Uh, demographically, we're now entering our demographic peak. By that, I mean more and more people are entering voting age, and that's going to continue for about 10 years, and then that's going to stop, mainly due to the Haredi growth uh, demographically. 
Um, so now we're basically a large community and we're gonna grow from about 21% to almost 27% of the population by 2035. And therefore, and then after 2035, we're gonna go down a little bit. So it's important that we take advantage of the next 15, 16 years electorally to have more members of parliament influence the system from within. Um, and also with the demographic rise of the Haredis uh, in Israel, the ultra-Orthodox, actually the economic potential of the Arab community grows. Put it simply, the state of Israel now is gonna rely on the Arab community. Up until one generation ago, it was the other way around where Arabs were not a big economic factor in the state. Now we actually are a big economic factor. If Israel is interested in maintaining a high level of, of economic income, it will need a very um, vibrant, economically vibrant Arab community. So why do we not take advantage of that? That's one argument for uh, participating uh, in, in the elections. Boycotting is also a little bit, it, it's somewhat clear, the fact that we're ineffective, the fact that nobody really cares about us. Um, one argument obviously that came up in April was, well, you have the nation state law, right? Um, you, you guys keep on telling us to vote, to participate, but every single time we get another slap on the face. So what we need to do is basically leave this system, expose Israel's true face to the world, there's a very famous saying in Israel, in, in Arabic, sorry, um, 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 which means if it doesn't, if it doesn't grow, uh, then it won't, it, won't, it won't shrink again. So we need to show Israel's true face to the world. We need to grow this boycott, and only then Israel would learn. So that, so that basically more or less um, is the arguments of both sides. Um, let me just put in a few words about the nation state law, and this might actually be a little bit controversial, but this is my feeling. I think that the nation state law really received, um, it's not as big of an issue as people really think it is, because de facto, de facto, it didn't really change a lot on the ground. Now, there are two problematic issues with the nation state law. I mean, all of it is problematic, but there are two, two issues that are more problematic than other issues for me. One of them obviously is the symbolic issue of the Arabic language, the fact that the Arabic language no longer enjoys the same state status that it did in the past. But the truth of the matter is that the Arabic language never really uh, enjoyed any speci special status to begin with. Um, one thing that really always used to anger me, I mean, I live in the United States at the moment, but you know, driving on the highway and seeing how um, the Arabic language is written, always there's always these grammatical mistakes. Arabic is not always found everywhere on public institutions, et cetera, et cetera. So Arabic was really always, quote unquote, discriminated against. And here I wouldn't only blame the state, I would also blame my own community that we never really respected our own language in the way that it should have been respected. And obviously the second issue is um, the fact that the nation state law prioritizes Jewish settlements. And by settlements, I don't mean settlements in the West Bank, I mean settlements in Israel. I mean, that's also the same word in, in, in Hebrew as well. So I'm not, I'm not referring to the West Bank settlements. Um, but the truth of the matter is that Israel has always prioritized Jewish settlements. As Freddy said, um, ever since 1948, there are over 700 Israeli towns, villages, and cities that were built while zero Arab uh, urban areas have been built. Actually, not only that, um, in Israel today, Jews have different methods of living. Jews can live in a kibbutz, and I'm guessing most of the attendees know what a kibbutz is, a moshav, and I'm guessing, again, most people know what a moshav is. People can live in cities, Jewish people, that is. Um, they can live in villages. There's even this phenomenon that's growing, especially in the Negev, which is called Chavat Bodidim, or individual farms, where basically the state of Israel would subsidize for Jewish farmers to move to the Negev, create all these farms where they have massive land for only one family, while only on the other side of the road, you have over 40 <coughs> unrecognized Bedouin villages in, in the Negev itself. So this whole idea that the nation state law has kind of created a new rea reality is not really true in my opinion. What the nation state law has done, it's more of a, um, it's, it's, uh, it's more of a, how, how, how do we call it in English? Um, um, a populist law really um, of a new political elite in Israel and has much more to do within the cultural war amongst Jews in Israel about, about the state of Israel, what does it mean to be a Jewish state? That's really what the nation state law is about. It's more of a Jewish cultural war that obviously affects the Palestinian citizens in, in Israel themselves. Um, so um, um, that's, that's, that's my opinion on these. I know it's a bit, a bit controversial. I'm pretty sure many people in circles around Partners for Progressive Israel have been 
um, you know, um, against this nation state law, but in, in reality, it doesn't really change facts on the ground. It has much more to do with populist tendencies among this new political elite in Israel and this cultural war going on within Israeli Jews about what does it mean to be Israeli? What does it mean to have a Jewish state? Is it an ethnic component, a cultural component, or an ethno-religious component as this new political elite prioritizes? So those are just my, my thoughts on the issue. Uh, we, we can't hear you on while you're muted. It's unmuted. All right. Now you can hear me, huh? Um, so thank you for those who have already typed in their questions. Um, as a reminder, if you're watching this webinar and have a question, you can type it in to us. That's the only way we can get it. Uh, I saw people typing in in the chat room. Um, it's easier if you type in the Q&A box instead of the chat room area. And you guys, the panelists, can look at the chat. There's an interesting conversation going on. Uh, Fadi, maybe you should look at it too. Um, yeah, I saw that one about the indigenous. Uh, yeah, and we can address that in a little bit. Um, so again, the Q&A is at the bottom of the monitor. You might have to move your mouse to find it. Click on there and then type in your question. Uh, your microphones are turned off, so we can't hear you. Um, the only way we can get your questions is if you type them in. Um, so we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Um, the first thing, Fadi, would you like to address the indigenous, not indigenous argument, or um, would you like to go to other questions and get back to this? Uh, yeah, I'll just add something in short to the nation state law. Um, I agree that up to now it was declarative, and as I said, it reflected the system in place. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, the, the opportunity here is to to address the, problema the problematic uh, things within the system and change them, and not just to go back, roll back, and have the nation state law canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, the danger of the nation state law behind the declarative aspect of it is that the next government can take it and have legislations based on the spirit of the nation state law, racist legislations. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is still to, to follow. Uh, but this is the, the, the big danger in uh, the near future. Um, I would like to refer to the question um, when Fadi refers to Jews as non-indigenous that both denies our own history and puts an unnecessary wall between us. Can we see each other as indigenous and see a win-win for us all? So I would say, um, I, I don't like to argue about indigenous, not indigenous. For me, it's, uh, it's less a matter of uh, what defines an indigenous. It's, it's a matter of at a certain period of time, there was a group of people living in the space. Uh, part of them were Jews, part of them were Christians, Muslim, um, and uh, we can call them subjects of the Turkish empire, of the Ottoman empire at a certain period or uh, after the English mandate later on, doesn't matter. These were people living in villages and towns in, in this space. And they were ex expelled. And they were expelled under uh, a claim of the Jewish people coming back after 2,000 years uh, from exile. Now, I don't ignore Jewish history in this place at all. Uh, I, I, I do believe that uh, Jewish people were part of this uh, of this space. I just don't think it's a legitimate claim of any nation or any people come and say, I want to expel other people living in a certain space because I have uh, 2,000 years ago lived at that place. Um, and I think this is, this is the source of the problem. And after that, I don't care. Now, this is from one hand, like looking back to, to history. Uh, in terms of future, um, no, I'm like, my aim is not to put walls. It's the other way around. I think this space needs to be shared between Jewish Israelis that live here today. Um, most of them are immigrants from the last, let's say 100 years, but it doesn't matter. They're now here and they see this place as, uh, as their belonging. Um, and Palestinians were paid a price of, of a problem they didn't cause or didn't participate in, uh, happening mainly in Europe. Um, and this needs to be fixed. I think the ignorance of what happened to the Palestinians in establishing the State of Israel need to stop. And we need to recognize that there is a need to 
uh, to fix it and to have this place as a shared place for Palestinians and Jews together. Um, then we, we can argue about uh, the process, um, which type of state is it going to be, what its name or its flag. This is minor, this is symbolic. Um, the main issue here is who this place belongs to. And for me, it belongs to Palestinians and Jewish Israelis. And when I say Palestinians, I mean all Palestinians who were in this space um, at the time of uh, the establishment of the State of Israel. Yeah, we can hear you. Can hear you. Again. <laughs> <laughs> I keep forgetting that I mute it. Um, so hopefully this will answer the concerns of people in the chat. And I think it's important to clarify when we say non-indigenous um, or Palestinians were indigenous, we also consider Palestinian Jews who lived there before the establishment of the State of Israel. Like anyone who lived there before um, 1948 happened and people were kicked out and all, all things happened. So that's what we mean by indigenous versus non-indigenous people. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that's what you also tried to say, Fadi, right? Yes. Okay. So I have another question. I call them, I call them Jewish Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's the other thing. We just refer to them as Jewish Palestinians. Um, so I think there's a question from Lawrence um, talking. I, it's live now um, and I, you all can see it. Um, so the question is, what do panelists think of Palestinian citizens who stand for non-list parties? Would, uh, would you tar them with the same brush or accept that some choose to work within the system for good or bad? Lastly, would you distinguish between, say, uh, Isawi of Meretz versus the reactionary like uh, Ayub of Likud? Um, I would distinguish between most normal human beings and a Yubkara. Um, um, <laughs> more seriously, um, no. I mean, obviously, people have different points of views, and these and these points of views need to be. Um, um, people need to uh, represent their own points of views. I would distinguish between merits and the rest of. Um, uh, of the uh, uh, parties that identify as Zionist parties because Meretz, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, personally, I do not vote for Meretz, but I think Meretz um, has made a long way in recognizing that there's a massive problem here um, and that we need to fix that problem and that Israeli identity and the identity of the Jewish state should be up for discussion. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean they would agree with somebody like me on everything, but nonetheless, they are willing to, you know, you know, pass that Rubicon and admit that there is a huge problem with the, how the state identifies itself. So I know I think somebody like Isawi Fridge is, is somebody who um, I would personally consider him to be part of the mainstream of the Arab community in Israel, especially nowadays where there are more and more people who would agree with him. I think the fact that uh, Meretz received a lot of votes from the Arab community is not by chance. I think there are a lot of citizens, and again, I'm not, I, on the personal level, I wouldn't agree with them entirely, but I do understand what, where they're coming from, that our, um, um, we should be focused more on the civil issue. Um, we should be focusing on making an Israeli public sphere more inclusive. However, however, I do think that Meretz is the only exception that does not represent the trend in Israel. I mean, what we saw with Zohar Bahrul and labor, for some reason, people always thought that the labor party in Israel somehow this kind of movement that can represent all of Israeli society. I do not think so. I think going from labor and, and all the way to the right, you have the same kind of problem that these, these movements and these people do think that excluding the Palestinian citizens of Israel is part of the norm and that the Palestinian citizens of Israel should join under our terms and not under the way they see themselves. And by that, they're basically excluding the Palestinian community in Israel. So I, I would argue that Meretz is actually um, a special case scenario um, that does not represent the trend that is going on within um, within the Jewish community in Israel. So no, I don't, obviously I do not have a problem with somebody like Isawi Fred, but I would have a problem with people like Ghadir Mreh, who's part of Blue and White. Uh, Zuhair Bahalul, who tried something new, 
Uh, we gave him the benefit of the doubt, but look what happened eventually. He was not even accepted uh, in the Labour Party um, itself. Even Ghalib Majadli, who was the first Arab minister in Israel, first Arab Muslim minister in Israel, there was a Druze minister before that, um, also, has, uh, also had a lot of problems when he identified himself as a Palestinian citizen of Israel. And that's something relatively new for Arab members of the Labour Party. So um, I do not have a problem with it. I think it's... Uh, I actually think that in, in, in certain aspects, they might be able to be influential in certain ways that the members of the joint list are not. And I'm very excited for this new, um, um, just yesterday it was announced that Mosi Raz and Yiseli Frej are gonna run together as coin jo joint heads of Meretz. It'll be interesting to see how this works out. I think it's gonna be somewhat problematic, especially that Mosi Raz, who's somebody that I really, really appreciate, um, I still think that he represents a segment, even within Meretz, that is not still very popular. Um, um, but it is definitely, without a doubt, uh, very interesting, and we'll see how where things lead to. Um, we have a question uh, about uh, the Jewish Arab leadership, for instance, American joint list fusion. Um, and what do you guys think of that? Is it possible? Do you think that the Arab community is, is, can it be appealing? to the Arab community uh, more than just an Arab list um, that is the joint list. Can, can you repeat the question? There, were some, there was some noise in the background. Okay, so I have lots of questions about Jewish Arab Jewish partnerships, specifically like, for instance, joint list merits uh, joining together or like creating some sort of Jewish Arab partnership that is, um, that, is, that, that is more or goes beyond the joint list that appeals to the Palestinian Israeli community. So do you think that's possible? Do you think that uh, could work? Or do you think um, that could be problematic and it wouldn't get any support? I, I think we should look at it sociologically. <laughs> Up to the 80s, around 50% of the Arab population was voting to Zionist uh, parties, uh, the Labour Party, at that time, uh, some to the Likud, some to the and it's hard to understand it uh, in terms of, you know, people have different opinions or choose their, their, their political choices. Um, we need to understand the power relations and that we're talking about a minority who don't participate in governance and, uh, and that is a subject to the uh, state policy and, and looked at not as a legitimate citizens, more as a fifth column or as, uh, as a danger, demographic danger to the state. And then we can understand why practically sometimes people say, oh, if I vote to somebody in the Labour Party, he can help me with this and that because he has access to, to the state power. Uh, maybe we can get a little bit of more budgets. Maybe we can get better infrastructure. Maybe we can get a sewage system and so on. Um, so it's not a vote that, that reflects, you know, ideological or uh, we, we, when a Palestinian votes to a Zionist party, it's not a vote that reflects really what he thinks or an ideological belief of, of that person. Uh, so that's why I'm saying we need to look at it from a sociological uh, perspective. Um, refer, and, and for me, if we look at the political parties seen in Israel, we have... Uh, Zionist Jewish parties uh, from the extreme right to merits, uh, which is within the Israeli political discourse is the most uh, extreme left, let's say, uh, but that's within the, the Jewish Zionist parties. And then we have the Arab parties and there is a variety there too. Uh, and there is one Arab Jewish party historically, which is, the, which is based on the Communist Party and Jabha later on, the, the front. Um, and I think if we talk about Arab-Jewish um, partnership, uh, it needs to be reflected on the agenda. And uh, my, my, I think merits went a uh, good way in the, in the right direction, uh, but it still didn't cross the main line uh, for Arab-Jewish partnership, a real Arab-Jewish partnership to, to exist and to have a joint agenda, which is the line of Zionism. Merit still define itself as a Zionist party and a Palestinian representative in Merit's would be part of a Zionist Jewish party, uh, the way it defines itself. Of course, it's much more liberal than other parties. It have some progressive positions 
uh, that I, that I can that I share with uh, and other Palestinian parties share share with uh, with merits, but still they didn't cross that line. And for me, if we want to look at the future and shape. Uh, shared agenda of how this place would be a shared place, uh, merits or other parties that want to be uh, a joint uh, uh, parties need to, to cross the line of Zionism. And I don't mean by Zionism, uh, let's say, like there are certain definitions of Zionism that I heard that I don't have problem with, like, you know, it's just loving the, the space or feeling belonging. I don't have any problem with that. The, the main problem with Zionism is the, is, the, is the basic paradigm that we talked about before, that this place below belongs exclusively to the Jewish people as it was reflected in the nation law. Uh, uh, Thayer, do you have anything to add to this? Um, so re regarding the uh, alliance or fusion between joint list and merits, I think that it might receive some traction amongst uh, the Arab population, but I don't think it would receive a lot of traction amongst the Jewish community. And therefore, that's why I would mainly think it's not the best of ideas. Maybe it's a little bit too soon. Um, um, I mean, the differences are still there. I mean, I don't really see as long as the conflict and the occupation continue, um, it would it would create a lot of problems, um, uh, both for merits and for uh, the joint list itself. There are still issues that clearly divide the two. Uh, the fact that uh, merits is still a Zionist uh, party and, and it defines itself uh, as such. Um, I think one of the issues that uh, that made Meretz move a little bit more to the left, um, in my opinion, is the fact that Meretz itself does not, maybe not no longer, but to a large extent cannot identify with this new form of Zionism that's taking place in Israel, which is much more ethno-religious, uh, which focuses much more on conservative values. And many people in Meretz are starting to find themselves outside of this consensus about Zionism that was once there. So, I mean, if this continues and looking at demographic trends, it looks like it's gonna continue. Maybe five, 10 years down the road, it would make much more sense. And I wouldn't think it makes a lot of sense for Meretz to unite with all of the elements within the Arab community. There are elements within the Arab community that still do not find um, a similar page with Meretz, let's put it that way, whether it's for religious conservative reasons, such as in the case of the Islamic movement, or nationalist reasons, such as in the case of Balad. But I can see in the long run, um, um, five, 10 years from now, a realignment in the, uh, in the map of the Arab community in Israel, um, realignment in the political map, that is, and then maybe Meretz and, or some elements of Meretz and some elements of Hadash, Jabha can come together and, and create some kind of new uh, discourse in Israel. But at the meantime, I don't think it would benefit Meretz, nor would it benefit the joint list. It might benefit the joint list more than Meretz in that sense. Okay, I think it's 1.30 now almost. Um, I know that our time is up. I have, I don't know, I was wondering if we could maybe answer one question really quickly. It's Deborah's question, which says, aside from comprehensive peace plan, what would be, uh, what would be the single most important step the Israeli government um, could take now to uh, help like, or fix some of the problems you listed among the Palestinian community in Israel? Um, in terms of policy or in terms of like specific policies or? I think we can start with specific policies. Well, in terms of uh, in terms of specific policies, uh, as we mentioned before, the main two issues uh, are um, arms and organized crime uh, within the Palestinian community, and that the state has the tools to deal with that uh, when there is a will. Uh, we have good examples of the state facing uh, organized crime in uh, in Jewish cities like Netanya. Uh, and uh, I'm taking control over, over the, the problem uh, while it's not dealt with in the Arab community. Um, and in the land issue, I think there is much more focus on budgets and the allocation of budgets than about the basic uh, injustice in the division of land. Palestinian jurisdiction areas are two and a half percent out of uh, the whole lands of, uh, 
what's within the borders of Israel, uh, while the Palestinian population is 20%. And the focus needs to be, to be shifted uh, to, to that area, uh, and not only to, to budgets and intensifying uh, building uh, higher and higher within the Palestinian communities. Um, I mean, I mean, similar. Um, it should probably be focusing on budget allocations and trying to improve the life of Arab citizens more. But I would still focus on the fact that without comprehensive peace between Israel and Palestine, it would be very, very hard to achieve anything meaningful. In my opinion, I'm not sure Netanyahu is going to agree with you, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we can't hear you, uh, Anwar. You're muted. Sorry again. Uh, we have lots of questions that we didn't get the chance to answer. Um, questions about women's issues in the Arab community, uh, lack of representation, questions about um, maybe like, uh, is there resistance? I think it was Dan who asked that if there's a desist, uh, resistance in the Arab community about normalizing ties with Israel, um, and is it getting harder to mobilize Palestinian citizens of Israel to engage in the work of civil society groups trying to build shared society like Givat Chaviva? Um, so I know we're past the time, but maybe we can take a minute to answer this question and then we can uh, close. Maybe you should also answer the women's question since your PhD was on women in politics. <laughs> Yeah, that, I feel like we need another webinar for that. <laughs> Without a doubt. So any of you want to address this question? Fred, you're the one who works in the NGO world. You go for it. <laughs> uh, I didn't hear the question well. Uh, you are muted again, Anwar. <laughs> it is saying, is it getting harder to mobilize Palestinian citizens of Israel to engage in the work of civil society groups trying to build a shared society like Givat Chaviva? Um, well, the simple answer is yes, <laughs> it is harder. Uh, there is less and less belief in, uh, in working for a shared society. There is less and less belief in that there is, uh, you know, the famous sentence of Barak, there is no partner. So <laughs> there is a belief within the Palestinian community that there is no partner on the other side. Uh, and that it's used each time uh, you are working in a joint group or in a joint project or in a joint organization, you are part of normalizing the injustice. Uh, and it's used kind of uh, to show uh, a better face of, of Israel than it is. Uh, so there is, there is more, let's say, growing discourse uh, in, within the Palestinian community that you need to work uninationally and you need to build uh, to build yourself internally uh, and to empower the community from, from within before going to uh, work for joint uh, projects uh, and so on. So but part of it is kind of strategic uh, or tactic, but part of it is part of disappointment of, you know, there is nobody to work with, uh, there is no chance uh, in a shared agenda. But there are many groups that do that. <laughs> That's true. So um, it's time to bring this conversation to an end. Fer and Fadi, thank you very much um, for participating and sharing your thoughts on the questions and the issues. Um, you guys now have one minute to give a concluding statement, and then um, we'll end this session. Um, I, to conclude, I don't know. I mean, um, since we're back in election season again for the second time this year. Um, I guess um, one thing to look out for um, on Arab-Jewish relations in Israel is whether, first of all, if the joint list uh, comes back again and it, everybody expects it to come back again because if not many people believe it would simply be political suicide on the part of the Arab parties. Um, and after that, are they able to kind of build something new uh, with some partners within uh, the Jewish community? And when I mean that, I'm specifically focusing on merits, maybe some left-wing elements uh, uh, within labor, depending on how big labor would be. Um, therefore, I actually think that it's in the interest of everybody that labor and merits do unite. I think that would actually kind of strengthen the more left-wing voices within labor itself. So um, that's definitely something to look out for. We might, and again, um, I am pessimistic, but we might be 
witnessing something new in Arab Jewish cooperation at the political level in Israel. So that's so that's definitely something worth uh, looking at. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I think if we look at the macro, I think we are in an interesting period. Uh, in in one hand, there is a right wing government. Things doesn't look like going to to a more optimistic direction. I think for the long run, we are going to the death of the two state solution, and to starting talking about one space for for both in one state, including the West Bank and Gaza. Um, and I think this discourse is gonna is gonna um, be more and more uh, there in the future. Um, I'm like for the long term. I think this this period of time now doesn't look very optimistic. I, I am optimistic for the long term because I don't think that th things are more clear now. Uh, I think there is a lot of people who are reconsidering their perceptions toward the situation in Israel and Palestine and that it's, it's going to move forward at a certain point to a uh, direction. And uh, thank you for having us. <laughs> uh, we can't hear you again. Yeah. Again, thank you for joining us for this conversation with Israel and Palestine. I want to thank our panelists, uh, and Teddy. Also, thank you to the staff of Partners for Progressive Israel for their work in making this discussion happen. You can go to progressiveisrael.org to learn more about Partners for Progressive Israel and their future programs. Thanks. Goodbye.